Welcome to Busy TV. Today I have Jason Crandall with me, who's in Aspen, Colorado, in the beautiful mountains in the United States, the Rocky Mountains there. Jason, welcome to Busy TV. Thank you. So, Jason, uh, you've had an incredible journey as an entrepreneur. You also have become a pilot yourself. So tell us about how you started your business career and at what stage and why you started flying. Well, I would say I started flying about 10 years into my business career after college. Um, coming out of college, uh, my father was a serial entrepreneur and uh, always was starting businesses or thinking of new ways to make money. And uh, when I was a senior in college, he was trying to launch a uh, multi-level marketing business selling beverage concentrates like lemonade or iced tea or coffee in a, in a multi-level marketing type of uh, okay, program. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so my senior year about, about, I had about <clears throat> six months left in my senior year in college. And I was like, well, oh, this is really cool. Maybe it's a way to make money. And I was going around school, like trying to recruit friends to, to, and, and really at the end of the day, it was just lemonade and iced tea and coffee and whatnot. And, uh, yeah. um, so it, it, it kind of went, um, you know, but most people were buying the product to make money, not because it tasted good or there was anything spectacular about it. Yeah. So we got into, when I got out of college was, uh, I grew up in the north side of Atlanta, Georgia, and that was in 1996 and the Olympics were coming to town and all of the big venues uh, were being built, like Nike had a big pavilion and, and you know, Reebok, all the brands were there and they were all building these pavilions to, to serve food and throw parties and whatnot. And so I was like, you know, I'm going to use these concentrates to make it easier for them to serve food was the idea. Okay. And uh, so I went and sold a lot of these brands on uh, on the, uh, these venues and on using these concentrates instead of, you know, brewing tea or brewing coffee. You could just get a big tub of water and dump this stuff in the top. Yeah. And, and it really sold well. I mean, people liked the idea. The problem was it didn't taste good. So, okay. so was this was this still with a, a multi-level marketing model or this moved into? Direction? No, this this is the multi-level marketing was too much work. Um. And so it wasn't a, that, it was, that, that, that route and you went down this. We road. hadn't necessarily abandoned it yet, but okay. we found that selling the product for what the product is instead of as something to make money on. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. So the product was, was still just not very good, but it was easy. So after the Olympics, I really got into trying to sell it into restaurants and I quickly learned that you needed some sort of a machine to pump the product. Okay. So I got to work uh, designing a sort of a machine that you'd hook up to water and and you'd put what's called a bag in a box of this concentrate in the machine and you pull a handle on the machine and and iced tea would come out. Okay. So that was a great idea. And you get you would sell it in restaurants. They were like, oh, this is so much easier than brewing iced tea and iced tea in America is huge. I probably should have, especially in the South, I probably should have yeah, clarified yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I've, you know, I've, I've some lived, of these, I've in, I have lived and spent a lot of time in the United States. So I'm familiar with everything from Florida all the way across to Los Angeles and in between. <laughs> sure. So every restaurant sells iced tea. So we're like, oh, well, this will be easy. You know, instead of brewing tea, they can pull this handle on this machine and tea just comes out all day, every day. We had this whole okay. marketing pitch and I made these videos. And so again, we ran into the same problem. You sell it in and a week later, they're throwing it out because it doesn't taste good. Okay. So I was like, you know, we got to figure out how to make this stuff ourselves, make tea concentrate ourselves instead of buying it from a big company that manufactures it. So I got a big hundred gallon tank and a bunch of tea leaf and a grill burner to make heat on the bottom of it and, and, uh, and threw a bunch of tea leaf in the, in a tank. And I mean, I've got pictures of video, of my father and I, in the, you know, probably 1998, like mixing up tanks of iced tea, and, and then we got this big filter system to filter the leaf out of it. And we ended up with a concentrated tea extract that tasted pretty good. And okay. so we took that and went back into restaurants and said, hey, try this one now. And they were like, oh, yeah, that's pretty good. So, you know, it's we through trial and error over a long period of time, we made a better and better product. 
And one day I saw in a grocery store all of these gallon jugs of iced tea that this grocery store sells. And it's a, it's a huge brand, in, especially in the Southeast United States. I won't say the name, yeah. but everyone could probably figure it out. And I called them up and said, hey, how are you guys making this stuff? And they're like, oh, we make it with instant tea powder. And I was like, well, you should try this. I called it tea extract because I wanted to get away from the tea concentrate yeah. moniker. And uh, I took it in there and they all tasted it. Like, wow, this stuff's really good. And uh, I did taste tests against instant tea powder. And they said, oh, this stuff's really good. Let's try it. And, of course, this this was over a series of months. This is kind of the, the short version. And they said, you know, let's go on a road show and do taste tests in all of our stores, which I did. And we won hands down across the board. I mean, it was just a huge win. And uh, and they decided to take it on. And it's, and it's one of their small markets. And, um, and it went, it sold really well. And then they said, you know, can you do like a peach flavored version? Can you do a, uh, raspberry flavored version? We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it kept growing and growing. And that quickly led to us not wanting to deal with restaurants anymore. And, and, you know, cause you've got a, a thousand, we didn't have a thousand restaurants. You got a hundred restaurants in Atlanta and okay. complaints, machines break. I was like, well, this is much better. We can sell this stuff in 55 gallon drums or five gallon pails and, and make make it a concentration level where one container makes a whole tank of their stuff, and it and it grew really quick. And uh, of course, this is about uh, you know five years into into starting this business, and uh, and with that idea, we went to all the big beverage brands, and you know how are you making your tea product? Well, we use this instant tea powder, and I was like, well, how try this? So we're talking the biggest brands in the world. And over the next five years or so, they all adopted our system for um, manufacturing their tea and coffee products that's in all the bottles and cans. I mean, to this day, if you go in a grocery store or a convenience store and you see any tea product or coffee product, chances are it's made by my company. And um, and uh, it was just a, a better system. And so to, to cut back a little bit, you know, we were making this in a tank with a filter system and we quickly realized, you know, this, this is unscalable. There's no way we can, we can do it like this. So we got, we bought a, a used centrifuge out of a dairy and used that to filter the tea leaf out. And then, and then we, we really came up against a wall where we needed like this million dollar piece of equipment that was a continuous system and it really wasn't even made for tea. And, uh, the only way we could buy this thing is, is, is with an SBA loan. And so I called the SBA and figured that whole program out. And really the way the SBA works is they'll, they kind of co-sign on the loan for you, but it's the bank that gives you the loan and the bank still wanted uh collateral. And so we did the math and, you know, we, we could take our costs from a dollar a gallon, let's say literally to like a penny a gallon oh, uh, with this new system. And so it, it made it was a no brainer. So my father, you know, being the entrepreneur that he is, put his house up as collateral. We got this loan. We bought this machine. We installed it in a, in our small office space that really was not designed for that sort of machine, but we didn't have any choice. We did it anyway. And so long story short, through learning new things and, and testing new technologies and always taking what you learn and applying it to business uh, that's what grew the business and, and we grew it and grew it and grew it. And we always had people interested in buying it, um, you know, from about 10 years on, which would, would have been about when I started, got into flying. Um, and then we finally in 2020 sold the company, um, to a much larger company that, that does a similar type of thing, but with onions and beets and, uh, you know, different products, but it was a, it was complimentary to their business. And, and, and now it's, uh, they've mushed it with several other companies. It's exponentially larger now. And, you know, yeah. it's just, it's in that. So that, tell us about flying. So you, you got into flying, was it 10 years ago? You said, no, I got into flying about 20 years ago. So okay. I okay. was traveling so much about two cities a week, flying commercial. And it, it was, you know, as you know, I mean, it's, it's a miserable experience, especially when you have to do it for business. And a lot of these, a lot of our customers back then were in the Southeast. So they were easy markets to get to if you could fly yourself. And I didn't grow up with an interest in aviation. I mean, it just it wasn't my dream. I mean, I, I wasn't against it, yeah. but, uh, but I, I, 
I was like, man, if I had my own plane, I could fly around. And, and at this point we were, we were making money. This was about 10 years into it. And so I talked to my accountant about how does airplane ownership work? And this is, this is like when Cirrus was kind of really getting their feet under them and, and moving. And they had, uh, I don't know, the G2 out at that point. And so I thought, wow, this little thing is so cool. You know, you go up 180 miles an hour. I could jump down to Savannah or go to, or, you know, Lakeland, Florida or over to Birmingham and visit customers and come back in the same day. And so I called the local airport and said, Hey, do you guys do flying lessons? I knew nothing of flying. Okay. And they were like, yeah, there's this kid, you know, I was 29 or so. And he's like, and I called this kid up, they gave me his number. And I was like, Hey, do you, are you a, a, a flight instructor? He goes, yeah, he was 19 years old. I go, well, I want to learn how to fly. He goes, he goes, okay, well, we can do that. And I said, what, what's your, what's your availability? You know, I'd really like to jump into this. He goes, well, you, you want to meet this afternoon? And I go, yeah. And, uh, we met, we sat down in the FBO and he kind of, you know, here's how lift works and stuff. And we went out, I, I don't know what it was, but I was hooked. I was like, this is the coolest thing that I never knew about, you know? And 30 days later, I had my private pilot's license. Yeah. Two weeks after that, I had my instrument rating done about, Two weeks after that, I had my multi-engine rating done. And uh, next thing I knew, I was buying a Cirrus. And so I got this SR-22, and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And uh, I used it to fly to all my appoint accounts. And, you know, I'm out and back in the same day. And, I mean, I, I don't I don't know how. I mean, it, it is airplane ownership and that freedom, and I say it to this day, is the greatest luxury in life. There is nothing better. I don't care if you have a Cirrus. I don't care if you have a BizJet. I don't care what it is. For you to be able to just go pull up to your hangar and put your car in the in the T hangar or whatever and hop in your plane and fly away. I mean, that's it for me. That's it. And uh so I, I had the Cirrus for about six months and I really got hooked on on Beechcraft. And okay. uh and I got on this this forum back then. This is uh, you know, two thousand seven. Yeah. There was there was really no online forum type of, and I liked forums at the time because to me, like watching people debate subjects is a great way to learn something. You know, you're not just taking one person's opinion. You watch two, two experts debate it. And you know, aviation, like everybody's got an opinion, like everybody, Oh, you're an idiot. You should be doing it like this. So, yeah. you know, um, I got on this website called beach talk and it was a brand new website. I got to know these guys that, that started it and they were cool. And the, you know, there was like 10 people on it and, yeah. And just through list watching people debate, I got into turbo normalized A36 Bonanzas. Like that was to yeah. me the pinnacle of aviation. Um, and I found this was, uh, you know, about now was about 2008 and the, you had the whole economic downturn. And I went to this aviation show and there was a brand new G36 that some guy had bought, uh, and had never flown. It had like a hundred hours on it. And it was first, I was talking to the guy and he was a beach crafter up. I he goes, Oh, well, this one's for sale. Do you want it? And I was like, really? What do you want for it? And he told me the price. And I was like, uh, well, yeah, I'll take it, you know? And, and I bought it right there. And I immediately sent it out what to tornado. The Cirrus? You, you sold the Cirrus. Sold the Cirrus pretty quick. Bought this beach craft, sent it, bought this Bonanza G36, immediately sent it to Tim rail over at tornado alley turbo in Ada, Oklahoma. Cause yeah. I wanted that tor that tor turbo normalized thing. Yeah. Okay. Sent it out there. They they put that turbo normalizer on it. I went and picked it up and I flew it back to Atlanta and I had a 73 knot tailwind. I'll never forget. I was doing 273 knots over the ground. And I was like, this this is the most amazing thing in the world, you know, and, and that was it for me. And I had that plane. I flew the wheels off that plane. I, I flew it a thousand hours in about three years. Um, and I'll never forget landing at Peachtree one day and the local Pilatus rep, because Pilatus was based there at Epps Aviation at Peachtree, came walking out to me and he's like, hey man, this is a cool plane. Have you ever, you ever thought of a Pilatus? I was like, well, yeah, but I mean, that's, you know, this was, this was 2012. So I'd been flying that thing for three or four years. I was like, yeah, but that's a lot of money, you know? And he's like, yeah, but you should check it out. So one day I was I was down visiting my parents in Florida and he he was like, I've got this, Pilatus, I'm coming back up from South Florida. You want me to pick you up? And I'm like, okay, sure. How am I going to get the Bonanza back? He's like, oh, I'll bring a guy. He'll fly back for us. I'm like, okay, I'll check it out. So he landed this this 2008 PC-12 NG, and it had 300 hours on it. Like uh, this guy had, that bought it had never really flown it. And I got in it. 
of course, just like last time. I mean, I, that was it for me. I mean, I just, <laughs> you feel uh, like <laughs> I got that, I got that damn Pilatus. I went to <laughs> school for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I went to, this was in December and I'll never forget flight. It wasn't flight safety. It was SimCom in Orlando. They had one opening to go to, it, you know, it's not a type rating for the Pilatus, but the insurance requires you to do the one week of uh, initial training. They had one opening and it was over New Year's Eve. And I was like, I'll take it. And so I spent New Year's Eve in some dumpy hotel in Orlando, Florida, going to SimCom every day. And New Year's Eve, 5 p.m. I'm sitting there in SimCom yeah. class getting this done. But I got it done, came back, got in that Pilatus, and I flew the wings off that Pilatus. I put I put 2,000 hours on that Pilatus over, I don't know, seven or eight years. Um, I got certified to fly it into St. Bart. I flew it into Aspen a million times. I mean, I, you know, every plane that you buy, for me, and I think everybody does this, you start using it on missions it's not necessarily designed for. So, you know, I'm doing six hour flights in the Pilatus, you know, peach tree to Phoenix nonstop. You know, I mean, it's six hours, but to me, it was better than flying commercial. I mean, I just loved it, you know, and I would load it up with mountain bikes or whatever. I mean, Jason, I mean, obviously you're using it for leisure, but you're using it for business as well. And yep. all these planes kind of paid for themselves because you've done deals that you couldn't have done. Oh, absolutely. Time. Because, you know, the, the way the IRS looks at uh, at airplanes is no different than a forklift or a, a car or any other piece of equipment used to run the business. So the business at this time was extremely profitable. It was either, you know, basically the goal of every business is to spend the profit because you're going to pay 40% on your, your profit anyway. So yeah, the, the airplane was a very small expense of the business at this, at this point in time. So yes, we were using it for business, you know, 100% of the time going to visit customers. And to me, like I said, it was just way better than flying commercial. And at this point, I mean, I had, you know, from 2007 onward, I just, I never flew commercial again. I just, I couldn't. So, so let's just go back a bit to the PC-12. So there you are, you've got this PC-12, you've been flying it around for a few months. Because you had the PC-12, did it just open up other possibilities for business as in, well, I could go there. Oh, I could go there. Oh, I could land here and go and see so-and-so. Um, did it make you change the way you thought about where you for sure? Because you're, you know, we're in uh, the products in these bottling facilities all over the world, really, at this point, but especially in the southeast United States. So if a customer would call with an issue, yeah, well, I'm there in an hour, you know, like I'm not, there's no, hey, I got a flight for three days from now. I mean, it, it was a massive upgrade, life upgrade, uh, and business upgrade to. A customer, you know, a, a thousand miles away in, in Dallas or whatever has a problem. And uh, I'm going to come right now and fix this yeah. problem. And, yeah. uh, it, yeah, it, it was a massive life upgrade. And even to this day, now that, you know, I've sold the company and I don't even, I'm not even in business anymore. The same logic applies. I mean, that what, what, what greater resources there in life than time, you know, and, and to save that time is just, it, you can't put a price on it. So absolutely, it is a huge business upgrade. The uh, private aviation is. So after flying the Pilatus for seven to eight years, what what next? What do you do next? Are you still allowed okay? To well, I sold the Pilatus in 2020 after I sold the company, and I bought a CJ4, and uh, uh, it was a used CJ4, and it was extremely low time. It was a family out of Memphis had bought it, and they just really didn't fly it very much. So. Um, I took it and immediately sent it to Stevens Aviation in Greenville, South Carolina and had it gutted because I had a vision of what I wanted my dream airplane to be. And the reason I chose the CJ4, and I, I say it to this day, is it's a fast Pilatus. It literally has the same range, the same useful load um, as a PC-12, but it does 430 knots and at flight level 450 instead of being stuck at yeah. flight level 250 with a hundred knot headwind in your face. So, I mean, it's just a phenomenal airplane. And, uh, so, so I sent it go to the airplane at Stevens Aviation. Would you have a new interior avionic upgrade? Did all, there's no avionics upgrades for the CJ4 yet. I mean, the, my, my, my serial number is a very, uh, new serial number when the, when the CJ4 first came out. And if you go buy a 2024 model, it's yeah. the same airplane. I mean, it's, yeah. it's pretty amazing. You know, everything in aviation, yeah. it's not like cars where, you know, you got a new thing every year. So 
Um, I gutted it, the whole interior, redid all the cabinetry, all the leather, everything, just put everything in it I ever wanted in an airplane um, and really made it mine. How much did it, Jason, the, the, the refurb of the interior? Uh, about $300,000. Oh, okay. So you put a new interior in, you took everything out and put new, new stuff in. New, okay. new, all, all new interior, put internet in it. Um, exactly. you know, and it just looks like a, it looks incredible. It's like a brand new airplane. So I did that three years ago. I've already put, uh, almost a thousand hours on that plane since I got it. So I've, I take it to Europe now, um, all through Central and South America, Mexico. I mean, I just, I fly myself everywhere in it and it's, it's incredible. I just, uh, this last year put the HF radio in it so I can do, uh, Bermuda to the Azores this summer. Um, so just to me, aviation for, for a kid that grew up not really knowing anything about airplanes to be totally just immersed in aviation in every way is to me, I mean, is a testament to aviation and that, and what an incredible life upgrade it is. And, and it, it, it's, you know, I love it. Love it. So, so tell me when you, when you finish flying in Pilatus, how many hours did you have when you transitioned over onto the jet? So when I sold the Pilatus, I had, let's see, I did about 2,000 hours in the Pilatus. I had about 2,000 hours when I bought the Pilatus, so I was at about 4,000 hours. Plus, I have I flew a lot of other people's Pilatuses for them because I got single, uh, I got commercial rated. So that was a thing I got into for a while as well. So I'm, I'm around uh, 6,500 hours now, all in with the, now with the jet. So when so you add it all, when you went to do your jet training, uh, I mean, do you always fly single pilot now on the jet, or do you have somebody with you? Or, well, and that's that's the uh, the reason I bought the CJ four. It is the largest, fastest single pilot jet yeah. built that insurance will let you fly a single pilot. You know, I, I would love to go get a PC twenty four, but the hull value on them. It's, you know, it's an unfortunate situation with it's insurance now. Yeah, they just, they, 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 even though it's a single pilot certified jet, the insurance company is like, yeah, you're not flying that thing, you know, a $12 million hull value plane by yourself. Yeah. So you're somewhat limited to that as an owner operator. Yeah. Um, so that's the reason I got the CJ4. Uh, and then, oh, dang, I forgot the first part I, of your I guess, I guess, Jason, you, you like the freedom to be able to say, you know what? Let's go to Mexico this afternoon. You don't have right. to call any pilots or anything. You just do your flight plan, turn up, refill the airplane, jump in and go. Like yes, I fly single pilot everywhere. Now, the, yeah. the beautiful thing about being in aviation for 20 years is all my friends are pilots. So yeah. when, I do big, when I do big trips going to Europe or South America or Mexico, you know, we go to Cabo a lot. I've probably got three or four pilots on board. I mean, they're, all my friends go with me. They all have airplanes too. So my whole life is aviation. All my friends are into aviation. So no, I have never paid someone to sit next to me and fly. I don't, I don't like that concept and chartering would never work for me. I mean, I tell people all the time, if I wasn't a pilot, I would not own an airplane. I don't, I don't like that. I want to go when I want to go. And I, and I currently, I build aircraft hangers too. I've got a, a project in Scottsdale, Arizona. I want my plane and my hangar with my car sitting right there. And I just go when I want to go. I don't want to wait on people. I don't want to manage people. I don't want, you know, I learned through business, you know, managing people is the hardest part of business. And I just, I'm at a, at a stage in life where I just, I'm done with it. And uh, yeah, I've always, always flown by myself. Okay. Tell us about your pilot training. So you got, so now you've got commercial pilot's license. You haven't got the ATP. I'm working, I'm doing the ATP right now. That's oh, going to, okay, yeah. yeah. So what type of training have you done throughout the years? Just simulator once a year, twice a year. Have you done any upset recovery training? Tell us a bit about that. Oh yeah. I mean, just, you know, um, I'd go to, uh, flight safety two times a year and, uh, okay. do sim training. I fly with, uh, I've done in aircraft training. So really whatever's required to do to, to maintain currency, I do. And then some, I just, I really enjoy flight training. Um, you know, I would, I enjoy the ATP classes that I'm doing and, uh, learning about these much larger aircraft and how to weight and balance, uh, a 737 yeah. and, you know, how to calculate how high you can go based on your weight because a small aircraft that, you know, you're going to make it to the desired altitude in a Pilatus or a CJ4. Um, but the, you know, these big planes, it, it, you know, they put so much on them. They, it changes everything. So it's fun. It's, I just, I love aviation. So learning it, it's a never ending, it's a lifelong skill and you never stop learning. So you think you're going to get another jet later on or you're sticking with this for the time being? 
Well, the CJ line is great because they're so common. They've been around so long. There's a yeah. million shops that work on them. There's a lot of options for training. Yeah. If I go to the Phenom product, which is beautiful, I love it. The 300 is incredible. You know, there's very limited training, very limited shops, very limited parts supply, um, and even more so with the Pilatus uh, PC24. I mean, will will I eventually do? I do. I think they're more beautiful airplanes. They are more beautiful than the Citation line. They're newer designs, yeah. but they don't go faster. They don't haul more. Um, and I sit up front. I don't care what's in the back, and I don't charge friends to come along. So I'm sure yeah. they're more than happy to be on board uh, the CJ4. Yeah, so tell me another business story where you did a deal and it was really the, the airplane played a, a vital uh, key in, in getting the deal closed. Well, the... Just being able to be there quickly yeah, and accommodate things quickly and, you know, oh, we put a 55-gallon drum of your tea extract in this tank and then we accidentally dumped a drum of raspberry on top of it, yeah. you know, and we're out of this thing, what can we do? And I would go to the airport and load a bunch of tea on the Pilatus and fly it over there and fix it immediately. I mean, that's huge. Oh, yeah, it is. Huge. Um yeah. I had that Pilatus loaded up with product all the time, flying around and, and visiting customers and getting stuff done. I mean, it, it is a, I mean, you just can't put a price on it. So yeah, yeah. just, yeah, I mean, just the time. Pilatus, Cause it's, it, it sort of lands on grass. It's got that cargo door. There's nothing yeah. really, that can, I mean, there's some other airplanes coming out now that can do similar things to the Pilatus and the, and the limitation. And I've had conversations with them in the past and I said to them, why don't you build this thing in America? you'd sell like twice as many. And they said, no, this is a Swiss product. It's being Swiss made and that's it. And we're only making it, we're only building a certain number per year and that's the way it's going to stay. Yeah. Look, I mean, they've got a great business model. I love Pilatus. I visited their factory in, in Stam, Switzerland. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I do think it's a mate. Well, it's cool that they build them in Switzerland. I think, I, I don't remember what percent come to America. I think it's like 90% of their product <laughs> comes, comes to the United States anyway. And I think it's pretty cool. They fly them you know, yeah. that Northern route into the States. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a cool concept. They've done a great job and, and yeah. they launched that PC 24 and I, one, one was being towed by my CJ four the other day. And I was like, wow, man, I mean, that is just, it looks like a miniature golf stream. It's just an incredible looking airplane. Yeah, so. yeah it, is, it is. So, so it's interesting. You explained uh, very well why you chose the CJ four platform. Cause obviously even for a pilot getting a tight rating, in reality, it's six ratings in one. Because you can fly the CJ one two three four, and then you've got the, right. the 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 Mustang, and then you've got the M two that you can fly. So it's it's and as you said, Cessna have got you know maintenance outlets all over the place. Uh, so it's easy to find spare parts; they get fixed. Um, you know, training as well isn't an issue because there's lots of places you can go for training, um, and that is a really important factor when you're when you're choosing which airplane to buy. Is is because you always I always tell people you're not buying a plane; you're buying time. So within the, the sort of time, the concept of time is when it breaks, because they do break down, okay, how soon can I get it back into the air? And so a lot right. of that will depend on where you fly uh, if, right. and, and, and are those parts available in that part of the world? Or if they're not, yep. how soon can you get there? Um, yep. And that's really the, the, the sort of question that someone needs to ask themselves. I think you've made, you've made a good choice there. Now, tell us about some important lessons that you learn um, on your path through, you know, this path of entrepreneurship. Uh, and of course, you've been flying as well. So tell us a few things that you learned, a few pieces of advice to anybody that's watching uh, um, that you've picked up along the way. Well, I mean, I, <clears throat> as far as entrepreneurship goes, I have a, a son who's a senior engineering major at uh, Arizona State University. And and my life lesson in is really, you know, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, it's much better to do it when you're very young, as opposed to, as opposed to older, after you have responsibilities, you know, when I came out of school, mm -hmm. it would, you know, my options were go to the military, which is actually what my path was, but it, it didn't work out because uh, of all of the Clinton cutbacks of the mid nineties. And they're just, and I went to military school my entire life. So I went, I'm a okay. Citadel graduate out of Charleston, South Carolina. And I thought I was going to go in the Navy and they were like, well, there's no jobs in the Navy anymore. So I was like, well, I did all this training. I'm going to go 
try to get on Baywatch in Los yeah. Angeles and see if I get it in TV. And, <laughs> and my dad just thought that oh, you're an idiot. You know, yeah. what, look, look at this. What about this, uh, iced tea thing I'm doing this yeah. multi-level marketing thing. And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't, you know, I did some job interviews, but they were with, you know, textile companies in South Carolina and whatnot. I just, I guess like my father, I just have that, that uh, entrepreneur bug. I never really wanted to answer to anybody. I always just wanted to do my own thing. And, I, yeah. you know, I wanted to make money. I knew I wanted to make money. Um, and so my, one of the worst things I hear young kids say is like, oh, well, you know, I just, I'm, I'm waiting for something that interests me. I'm like, you think iced tea interested me? It didn't, I don't, couldn't care less. I mean, even to this day, I wanted to make money. And at yeah. the end of the day, when you dissect any business, you're selling something to someone else. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be snowboards. It could be car tires. It could be iced tea. Yeah. Go sell. Go start doing something at an age where you have nothing to lose. You know, and I came out of school. I lived with my parents. I had nothing to lose. I'm going in trying to sell iced tea to restaurants, you know, yeah. and I had no other options. So use, use your youth in that time to capitalize. And, and, and you also don't know what you don't know. So, you know, when you're 22 years, you know, when you're 32 years old, you know, you've been around a lot of people. Oh, that's a bad idea. That'll never work. I had plenty How of people. Old is that, your son, Jason? How old is your son? My son is, uh, it just turned 22. I was in Phoenix oh. with him for his birthday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got a son who's 23. I've got four children. So my oldest. Oh, is good. Yeah. Right on. Right on. So, so, yeah. so yeah, that's, that's, that's my advice to anyone and my son is, you know, my, my son now, like he's doing job interviews. He's got interviews with some great companies, but. No, I'm like, you know, you have an option right now to, to do, to try to do whatever you want to do. Take risks while you're young. Take the risk then. And, and do you think it's easier today than it was back when you started with the social media you know, and AI and all this new stuff coming on? I think, on coming I think on. since the beginning of time, humans have believed that, oh, things were better back then. You know, it's just always been the thing. And I think a part of success in life is, realizing that that's just, you know, that's not necessarily true and that people have always said these things and ignore that and just move forward with, uh, you know, an idea. And I think you could come up with any product and if you hack on it enough, you're going to be able to sell it. Um, you know, I think there's loads of opportunity out there and uh, you just, you got to have the right mindset and the right drive and uh and just never take no for an answer i mean that's salesmanship right there yeah. that is just yeah. sales now just going back to you you, you said something interesting before you said that all, all your friends are pilots now what i've noticed since covid happened and we had all these massive lockdowns there's more and more people now like yourself the business people saying you know what i'm just going to ring up the local flight school i'm going to learn to fly and buy a plane and use it for business because i can't sit around and wait for the airlines and and, and you probably i mean Loads of people who experience this today, and some of the people watching would experience this. You, you book a flight, you get, a, you go to the airport. It's, there's a delay, and then it's a delay, 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 and then the flight gets cancelled, or your bags get lost. There's more of that happening now because there aren't enough pilots out there, and and this right. is what's what's driving the problem. A lot of guys retired, a lot of guys are getting sick, um, and so the whole airline system is is very, very unreliable. A lot more reliable than it was before COVID. So what I've noticed more and more people going to get their private pilot's license, buying something like a Cirrus flying around for about a year and then upgrading to a PC-12, flying around for a couple of years in that and then upgrading to a, to a jet. Um, and, and they're using the airplane all the way along to build their business. And guess what? The business is paying for everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and guess what? They're doing 10 times more business than they would have done if they were sat there flying around with Southwest, Delta, Lufthansa, you name it. So um, that's what I've noticed. Through your pilot friends, have you noticed more of this happening as well? Well, for sure. I mean, I know guys like Cirrus, I, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily love Cirrus products at, at my stage in being a pilot, but I think they have done an amazing job at bringing people into aviation. And one of the thing, it being in aviation and being in building hangars like I am now, you see that the infrastructure in the United States and the FAA, which I'm a fan of, um, and I include the FAA in uh, American infrastructure. I mean, you see the future of 
aviation is in the United States. I mean, you cannot go do this anywhere else. I mean, I know there's guys in Australia that fly and stuff like that, but to be in a country like America, I mean, I've I've borderline gotten to the point where I don't really even want to leave America anymore because it's just so wonderful flying in this country. Um, You know, you go to, to Europe and you know, the, the European air traffic, so they don't even talk to each other from one country to another. They just oh, call this, uh, call this frequency when well, you I, cross over. Into that, I, I, I learned to fly in America. And then I did some of my training here in England and then in Italy. because I was living there at the time. Then I started flying private jets and flew for five different airlines, flew in the Middle East. I flew in all over. I was captain in Boeing 737 flying around that. I flew citations. I flew turbo commanders, Dornier 328s. So I've done all, all that. And, and when I did my training in the States, I did my PPL and my commercial pilot's license. I did Texas, my PPL at 17. And I went back when I was about 21 to do my commercial pilot's license in California. So I, I know what the aviation system is like in America. And you're right. It's the best place in the world for aviation. And I think it really does help businesses because if you count the the tarmac airfields plus the other airfields where you can land on grass, and there's about 10,000 plus airstrips in America where you can land. And you, there's nothing like that anywhere else in the world. Right. And if you do use it as a business tool, guess what? What happened to you is going to happen to, to whoever's watching because you're going to grow your, it's not, you're not going to 10X your business, you're going to 100X it because you can immediately spring into action on a plane fly 500 miles down the road and fix your client's problem within the space of a few hours that nobody right. else can do. Cause they, they thought, Oh no, my accountant told me it's not a good idea to buy a plane. Cause it's going to cost this, that, and the other. Well, if you just use it right, even if it does break down in your first year and you fix it, it's still going to make you money. Yeah. Yeah. And, and listen, nobody's capitalized on this concept better than Cirrus. Uh, yes. second, second, maybe Pilatus. Um, but yeah, the, the Cirrus con- has made it look cool. When someone they made it look cool. Cirrus, they say, this is a cool airplane. I wouldn't mind flying one of these. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, you know, the Lamborghini doors on it, you know, the interiors they do. My, one of my best pilot buddies in the world just took delivery of a brand new SR22 and I get in it and I'm like, these avionics and this thing is nicer than the CJ4. I mean, it's just amazingly nice and you could just fly them all over and the, the new Cirrus jet, like, well, now I have a jet, you know, who doesn't want to say that? <laughs> um, you know, in a hundred years is, is the United is private aviation and going to be bigger than it is now. I think it's going to be way bigger. I mean, what better way is there to navigate life than private aviation? And I think a lot of these countries where they've really got the airspace on lockdown, um, you know, maybe not so much Europe, but yeah, even Europe. I mean, they, they oh, could, no, I'll tell you they one could, thing, they're doing here in Europe. And just last week we had the corporate jet investor, conference in london and outside were all the environmentalists and there were environmentalists inside the conference as well so and and even some of the people in the industry going on and on about the biofuel and we have to be careful because we pollute the i mean forget it i mean you think elon musk elon musk wouldn't be able to do what he does if he didn't have his g650 no way no way i mean that they that these environmentalists want everybody on to fly together i don't know those environmentalists I mean, you know, don't- a, a, a number Private jets contribute to 0.02% of emissions. Cow farts contribute to 15%. So instead of knocking on the door of, you know, us guys that, that are in private aviation, why do you go and shut McDonald's down? Or, or, I don't or, even or, want to play that down. game with them. It's all hocus pocus, yeah. BS. In yeah. 499 AD, New Year's Eve, everybody thought the world was going to come to an end. This yeah, has been going on. It is, I don't know what it is. It's human nature somewhere deep in our lizard brains. Everybody thinks they're going to be alive to witness the end of the world. And it's just not true. And at the end of the day, there's a lot of money to be made on environmentalism. And a lot of the, the pawns that get recruited into the cause, they don't realize the people at the top are making money on this. Yeah. And, you and know it's the unfortunate. Thing, the other thing, Jason, and I think this is a problem with society in general, People, not only young people, even older people are too superficial in their approach to everything. They switch the TV on or they get on the Internet and they just believe what someone is saying. And we just look, we saw Kaka Carlson travel to Russia, interview Vladimir Putin. And I sat here and watched the whole interview for two hours plus because I wanted to hear what they were saying to each other. Mm-hmm. But then you go on Internet and there's all these people taking the whole thing out of context by taking a clip of 30 seconds here, a one minute there. And they say Putin's uh, brain's not there. Oh, Tucker Carlson said a super question and completely out of context. And then you imagine, you know, some of these journalists in Italy or France, or whatever, they take this small two minute video. They translate it probably badly. 
and then they put it out there. Now everybody in France believes, you know, these people are evil and look what they've done and whatever. And they're taking it completely out of context. And people are not sitting there and trying to think. It, the same is happening in schools now, even with pilot training. They're dumbing down everything and they're issuing even pilot licenses to people. I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. He flies for, um, and I won't say where this airline is because I could disclose who, who they are. He just said to me, oh, they've slashed command training by 50% to save money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, how no, dangerous it's, is it? It's, it's very dangerous, but and it has been going on since the beginning of time. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it's the dumbing down of uh, it, it, the, the, the relaxing of requirements to uh, allow a small subset of people that, you know, it's a very small majority. You know, I went through this when I was in military school. You know, I was in all male military school my whole life. And my uh, senior year at the Citadel was when the females sued all the way to the Supreme Court to get in. And and they had to change the requirements to uh, accommodate, you know, a woman cannot run as far or lift yeah. as much weight That's as a man. A so it's just a, it's just a genetic fact, unfortunately. Are we butting up against... Uh, the limits of that mind of that thinking, though, I, I somewhat feel like we are, but maybe people felt that way 20 years ago and I just wasn't old enough to see it yet. I, I somewhat feel like we're butting up against a wall of of this and aviation. You know, it ain't going to take too many crashes. And, uh, you know, if there if there were, God forbid, a, a commercial plane that went down that had a, a you know, a DEI uh pilot crew uh, uh, on board. No, no, I don't know I, if you're going to edit I mean, this. The, the thing <laughs> but, is, and I'll give you an you example. Know. When I was learning to fly, um, I wasn't going solo and, and there was something wrong and I, I couldn't quite figure out if it was me or maybe this wasn't for me. And then one day I was talking to another student who told, he said to me, oh, I think I know what your problem is. He said, you're scared of going into a spin because you know when you do the stalls, they make you bank 30 degrees and then pull and then stall and then keep the rudders going and keep the airplane straight. So I said, yeah, I think you're right. She says, well, I had the same problem. And then I said to my instructor, take me up and show me how to spin the airplane, get out of a spin. So I went to my instructor, told him the story. He said, okay, off we go. So he briefed me on what, how spins worked. We went up, we spun the aircraft. I came out, spin, no problem. Next day I went solo. And then it dawned on me. I thought, wait a minute, shouldn't this be mandatory in pilot training? And then I discovered in the 1970s, mm -hmm. it was mandatory, but because as soon as people got to that bit of their training, they bailed out because they got scared. And so they decided to remove it. Right. So when this happened to me, I thought, OK, so I need to get into some aerobatics. So I went and did an aerobatics course, learned how to fly upside down and loop the loop and all that kind of thing. It just gave me more confidence and more understanding of how an aeroplane works. And you see how many accidents and incidents have happened because of ups people getting in upset recovery situations. And so upset recovery training has been really, is now being put into training um, and, and become mandatory, but in the simulator. But I still think, you know, I think it's important for somebody to mm -hmm. jump in a jet and go up 35,000 feet and come up upside down and stall and loop the loop and get into a spin and out of a spin and, and learn all those things, because I think it's important, even though some airplanes today are a lot easier to fly than, than the airplanes of the past, but still you can get yourself into an upset situation and, in particular, if you're an entrepreneur and you've got money and you've got your own jet, you haven't got the budget that the airlines have. Like I said, this airline now that I was mentioned before, they've, they've, if you're training to be a captain and suddenly they said, oh, uh, your training is going to be 50 percent of what your buddy did last month because we decided to uh, th there's nothing you can do. But if you're an entrepreneur and you own your own jet, you can say, mm -hmm. you know what, I'm going to go for sim training three times a year and I'm going to do upset recovery once a year. I'm going to go four days out and fly some fancy jets and do all the stuff and whatever. And I'm just going to increase my training just for my own knowledge and safety, which by the way, if you, if you send those certificates to the insurance company, they'll be even happier and they probably bring your premium down um, and improve things for you. But it right. just makes you safer and it gives you a more in-depth knowledge of how the airplane works and how this, this whole, you know, thing, thing works when you're up there in the sky and icing conditions and, and whatnot. Uh, and very often, you know, accidents happen because pilots didn't know something. Um, or they took something a bit too lightly and, 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 and weren't careful about it. But, you know, training can address that and education can address that. 
And I think that's important as we're talking aeroplanes, but it's not only important in the aeroplane thing, it's also important in, in anything else. I mean, one thing my wife and I learned to do many years ago was read the labels of the things that we put on our body or inside our body. Learn to read those labels of the shampoos and mm -hmm. the perfumes and the yogurts and yeah. whatever you may buy. And and because, you know, you can avoid put, just because it's on the shelf in the supermarket doesn't mean it's good for you. Um, and, but but, you know, you start to think right. about these things. And I think that's what's lacking. Uh, and it's a, a problem in society in general. Uh, and I'm surprised over these last few years with this whole Ukraine, Russia thing, where they're all saying Russia, Russia, Russia is bad. And no one's even thought of going and interview Vladimir Putin and asking him, well, what's your take on this story? Yeah, there's two sides to every story, exactly. three sides to every story. You know, you've got to expose yourself to everything in life. And I mean, I think that's a trait of many yeah. entrepreneurs as well is like, you just can't take yeah. somebody's word for something. You know, again, why do I love online forums? Because I can sit there and watch two guys argue about turbo normalization versus naturally aspirated or, you know, spin training or whatever. And you just, you can get exposed so fast to differing points of view and, you can never just take your someone else's word for anything. You've got to go learn it for yourself because there are no facts in life. There is no real truth. There is just what's true for you. There is what path is the right path for you. You can't just do what everybody else is doing. But are these problems that have been around, you know, for since the beginning of humanity? I mean, I love watching Warren Buffett interviews because he's if you really listen to him, he'll tell you, you know, I have been in the market and I've been an investor for, for 60 years. And he goes, I've never pulled my money out. I've been in, I've been through every type of, Oh, this is the end of the world. This is it. And it always comes back and everything always comes back. And, you know, you can go back to the origins of yellow journalism. I mean, I don't know if, if it really is the origin, but you know, they credit William Randolph Hearst, for owning, you know, 90% of the newspapers in America at the turn of the century. And, and, you know, the Spanish American war was, was begun by claiming that the USS Maine was bombed off the coast of Cuba. And it was yeah. really like one of the boilers blew up, you know, and that's how they got that war going. They, they, you know, the politicians wanted the war. So is what's going on now any different than then? I don't know. Have there always been sheep in this world that just are willing to gobble up whatever comes off their TVs? Yeah. Now, I watched the Super Bowl last night. It's the first time yeah. I've watched TV in years. And I couldn't believe the mind control that was, that was coming off of that screen. It was borderline. It was intolerable to me. I mean, I could. The commercials were ridiculous. I mean, when I grew up as a kid, the Super Bowl commercials were the most amazing thing in the world. Now they're... You know, even the halftime show, they're wheeling out these old acts from the 20th century. You know, everything's some actor who was famous in the 90s or some yeah. singer who was famous in the 90s. So they can push the the new product of today. And it was like, you know, the, they had that Pfizer commercial on there. I could not believe how awful that commercial was, in my opinion. But, you know, it's it's going, the mind control has it been going on? I mean, look at us. We're full on into politics now. But I mean, yeah, has it been going it on since the beginning of time? Maybe so. I mean, I Maybe. think, you know, today with, with yeah. the advent of citizen journalists, where each one of us can be a journalist by just switching our phones on and saying something and posting it. Um, and, and then people are free to listen. For sure. People are free to decide if what you're saying makes sense or not, or if you want to buy into what you're saying or not. Like the same here on BizJet TV. You come here, you listen. Um, you, you've given a really interesting story. Um, why you, you, you're, you're flying your CJ4 today, which I think makes perfect sense. Um, Business-wise, what, what, you, what are you aiming for in the future? Are you just sitting there now enjoying life and then seeing where, where, where the next opportunity presents itself to you? Well, I, I love aviation. Um, you know, there's an old saying, if you want to become a millionaire in aviation, start out as a billionaire or whatever, whatever variation number you want to throw in there. So I've done a good job of avoiding get, really getting into business in aviation. I love the concept of hangars in aviation. There is a massive yeah. shortage and has been forever. Um, you know, this, this, one of the new hangars, I've, all the hangars I build, I'm putting in, uh, heliports that are, that are registered through the FAA because oh, the Beatles, I mean, I'm not a big believer in this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a big believer in that technology, at least as it stands. I mean, I think, uh, you know, helicopters been around forever and you don't see them landing at the mall all the time. So I don't think that's really coming, but I think the push for in that is going to keep growing. And, you know, I would like to 
ca- you know, it doesn't really cost anything to add a heliport to your hangar. But I think, you know, just parking for aircraft, I think in a hundred years, private aviation will be big, way bigger than it is even now. I think if uh, these other countries want to 10x their economies, you know, open up private, encourage private aviation, quit acting like everyone wants to come, you know, fly their airplane into your Capitol building because uh, it, it is a huge business upgrade. And uh, I don't know if the rest of the world will go that way. I mean, I think America leads the way in, in a lot of things um, and it forces the rest of the world to yeah. to conform to, you know, a little bit more freedom over time. And, you know, things things in the world, they change takes place over 30 years. It doesn't change take place over a month. So you really got to look back even 100 years, look back a century. I mean, things that happened 100 years ago, we're living with the consequences of those things today. And uh Okay, super. So, yeah. Jason, thank you very much for being think- here on BizJet TV. Everybody, subscribe to the channel and give us a thumbs up and comment below. What do you think? And also remember, you can get yourself a copy of my book, The Quantum Economy, by clicking on the link below. Jason, thank you once again, and we'll have you again on the show in the future, I'm sure.